Welcome back to the Gosh Stuff Podcast. I am your host, Anthony Claiborne, joined by my good friend and co-host, John Espy, today. And we are over the moon excited because joining us today, I actually told John, I feel like I should say we're not worthy to have the incomparable Craig Stallman saw your own with us. Man, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Oh, come on now. Keep it real. It's just me, brothers. <laughs> Dude, I, I your resume. Your resume is everything Rambo wishes he was. <laughs> well, you know what the deal with that is? I'm too dumb not to go for some of these uh, life <laughs> dreams that young boys think they want to do. And you, when you finally do it, you're like, wow, that was really dangerous. <laughs> I should have done that, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, but that, look, I, I, I think you, there's, there's a, a point to be made with that. I, I have no real exceptional ability. Physically, I think I was, I was quick at certain things. Football, martial arts, I learned that I had a, a speed that other guys didn't have. And perhaps a, a, an attention to detail due to an artistic uh, gene in my family. But other than that, I'm just a regular guy, truly just, a, and I struggle w- with life like everyone else does. But the difference between uh, myself and maybe some others is that I grew up in a loving and supportive family, and I felt secure enough and motivated to go, go for my dreams. Mm. If I wanted to go do something, I took action and I just went to go try to do it. And I learned as a little boy, well, if you want to be any good at it, you have to prepare. You can't just go do it and fall on your face. Well, that's, you can do it, but you're going to fail at doing it. Mm. And I learned that, you know, a little peewee football, you know, my first season, I'm like, I want to go play peewee football with all my buddies. And I did, but I wasn't any good at it because I didn't know the game and I wasn't prepared. So, but I was learning the next season. I was quite a bit better because my buddies and I would all practice at home. We put all all our pads and stuff in the front yard. And Wait a minute. You went out in the backyard and played like you didn't play video games and just, well, we had the mask on, right? We had the mask. (laughs) Oh, that's right. I got you. Bubble wrap. We were scared. We were, you know, but no, no. (laughs) Yeah. Actually actually into some, like you're talking about, like some of those things. So if if people don't know who, uh, Craig, yeah, lay it on them, John, lay it on them. Um, just, there's a couple, there's a couple of his accomplishments. First of all, I'm going to say the, the, the best one of them all is that he's a former Marine. I'm just saying former Marine, (laughs) um, there. And so uh, then, then he, he left the, the, the men's club to join the Navy, (sighs) but he did at least when he joined the Navy, he did, the best he, the best that you absolutely could and and is part of uh, the seal teams then on went past the seal teams uh well with the seal teams but went to the elite of the seal teams in the seal team six uh as a sniper uh and so i think we're gonna call this episode silent but deadly because uh you know. so basically he's what terrorist like he's the boogeyman story that terrorists tell their children yeah Exactly. Well, that's that's what I wanted to be. That's that's exactly what what attracted me to the SEAL teams is reading stories about the Mac V SOG operators mm. and the mm. SEALs that operated operated in the Rung Sat Special Zone or the Forest of Assassins. Mm. Wow. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to to meet and and know some of these guys now, and they are the most amazing humans you could ever want to meet. And, and a lot of them are still pretty humble, but they've killed so many bad guys and uh, they just uh, are, are make it happen kind of guys. And the, the seals that operated in the rung sat just really terrorized our nation's enemies. I mean, they went into enemy territory and did the spookiest, scariest stuff and really, really turned around uh, the activity in the areas that they were responsible for with their their uh, operations. And so I wanted to operate with those guys. I wanted to become one of them. I wanted to bring that level of contribution to our national security and uh, kick the pants out of the bad guys before they came here and ruined our sanctuary, sanctuary of freedom and liberty for our wives and kids and, and families and friends, you know. So, uh, man, that's, that's what I meant to be. And I wanted to because – amazing uh, I, my outlook on being a warrior i learned 
really when I was in junior high, one of my dad's friends was a, he was a, he's a member of my, our church. My dad was a very sincere uh, spiritual leader and pastor of a church. And a friend of his uh, decided to become a school teacher, a, a Sunday school teacher. And he had a handful of us, you know, rough and tumble Southern Texas boys to, to train and, and uh, teach the Bible to. And he's like, man, what am I going to do to get these guys' attention? Because we are all, you know, fighting martial arts tournaments and, you know, riding dirt bikes and uh, just, just rough and tumble outdoor kind of guys. And so he said, well, I got it. I'm going to take the life of King David from beginning to end, mm. and I'm going to make a, a series out of it. And we're going to go in depth and teach these boys about uh, a warrior for God and, and what that means. And, and that's shaped my psyche on what a warrior is to be that, you know, the Bible says Saul killed his thousands and David, his tens of thousands. I thought, oh my gosh, how can you in the natural sense fight, in battles with spears fly spears and arrows flying everywhere and swords all around you with hundreds of warriors killing each other and survive to kill tens of thousands that's a supernatural relationship and i imagine that would have been a warrior that that was speaking to god out loud mm. as he was fighting that's the only way i mean you got to be tuned in to that degree to to, to survive that much that, uh, that's amazing hand-to-hand that's one, combat yeah you that's know? actually one of the things so, that, that i have a question there about like in that in some of the situations you've possibly probably been in with with still team six and, and other teams you've been a part of and those kind of things when crap got really squirrely really sketchy you know is there this this calm that comes through comes through that allows you to, to do the mission there is there any thought uh, of oh man this could this could not go bad this could go this just could not this could end not end well um is that does that happen this if it does uh is there a calm if there is anxiety come up this this is your spiritual connection and, and your walk with jesus is that does that help you have that has that helped you through those situations or have you found brother, that not it, to be no brother it was everything it was everything and i think some of my teammates didn't understand it look here's one one example i can talk about in, in desert storm we were taking down the first prisoners of the war, my, my SEAL Team platoon, at SEAL Team 1, off of islands, off of burning and sinking ships, off of oil rigs. And there was a, an oil terminal. It was multiple oil rigs connected together in the Persian Gulf. And we had flown in helicopters and fast roped down onto the rig to take some, some prisoners there. And my faith was so strong and it wasn't that I did not realize the danger. I'm, I'm not an idiot. I understand yeah. the precarious nature of combat and that a bullet could come from anywhere at any time. Uh, but my faith was so strong that it didn't matter to me. I'm like, God, if a bullet's going to come take me right now, I'm ready to come home. Mm. And, and I just wanted to be a humble servant and a warrior and obedient. And so my job as, as a point man, well, I'm the first in, well, shoot, I smoked down there. We had one covering uh, the, the, the deck of most of the, the Iraqis that were on this, this terminal with a machine gun. And I, I roped in, I was covering with a, with a sniper rifle at first. And then I roped in and I ran with my M14 across the, the deck, probably a couple hundred yards to get to where these guys were. This was a big terminal. And, uh, it, and, and I was in a hurry to get to the, the enemy combatants so that I could gain control of them, prone them out, separate them from their weapons so that they weren't a threat uh, shooting at the, our other helicopters and my, my teammates to follow. So I was just trying to get there early and gain dominance. And my teammates it wasn't until the debrief they're like my god saw man just ran smoked straight across to the enemy and didn't even look back he was 75 yards ahead of us and and it wasn't that i was trying to not work as a team or leave my mm -hmm. teammates behind it's just that, that at that moment i needed to be present in the enemy's face with the with the weapon to, to gain that dominance because they were they were wanting to submit anyway they weren't 
they weren't on their guns and, and firing. It wasn't a, yeah. a hot situation where we would have needed to, to work in concert to, to, def yeah. to defeat them with overwhelming fire superiority and, and shoot, move, and communicate to get up there. It was uh, the, They were indicating they wanted to surrender anyway, so I just wanted to go ahead and, and assure that that was, in fact, the case. So, yeah. you know, what would cause me to do that? Well, am I some sort of major heroic, uh, you know, tactical you know holier than thou monster kind of a cool guy no i'm just a regular guy but i had faith and my mm -hmm. job was to was to engage the enemy and uh and so i was okay with whatever happened so john yeah you to answer your question it, it was everything man i felt like god was right there with me and whatever happened was going to be okay it didn't matter which way it went to me so much so yeah. you, you I, I think that's that's a great way to be in combat you, you hit on something, brother, that uh, really stuck out at me. Uh, two things as I was, as you were, you were speaking that kind of came to my mind is uh, you, you talked about being a point man. And uh, I know that you probably, you may have heard of like Steve Farrar's point man book and, and how he compares like fathers and husbands to the point man of their family uh, to our guys listening uh, and, and, I'm kind of j even jumping ahead in my mind. I just like heard that. I was like, I had to seize on that moment. But like, how can we take those same principles that you have as a SEAL Team 6 member and apply them to being the point men for our families? Because we are, and we talked about this on the before the show hangout time, and you know, we are indeed in a very real crisis, a very real war uh, with the enemy for the heart and soul of our families and here in the United States, we would agree with each other, even for the heart and soul of our nation. How can we as dads and husbands become effective point men and use those principles you guys use? Well, to be a point man, you, you really, in, in the civilian life, you need to be a leader because you're going ahead of others. So the principle is, hey, follow me do as I do, I will lead the way. And that comes from leadership. So in a sense of a father, you know, the Bible says the, the man is to be the spiritual head of the household. And, uh, and that takes work and that takes dedication and, uh, and owning that space. And you have to, you have to do your, your part. And uh, that's, that's a leadership role. Go ahead, John. No, I was going to say, Anthony, don't, don't get your uh, panties in a wad. He said that you're supposed to be leading your home. I'm just saying, I mean, just, Make sure you're okay with that. You're this not, guy. You're not going. You're not going to like break down the crowd. Are you, you okay? You sure? You're good. Okay. This guy. My bad. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Keep going. My bad. Just had yeah. To, had to throw that in there. But it's, and a leader sets the culture in any entity, whether it's a corporation or a team or a family. The culture gets set at the top and enforced, and. Mm. Uh, it's only effectively enforced if people are tone, shown and told what they are to do and likewise what they are not to do. There needs to be a left and, and right lateral limit to what you're able to do. And I think right now our culture in the United States, we're suffering from a lack of enforcement because those limits are not being strongly enough enforced. And we've got people living outside of those left and right lateral limits that are some very big names, very big politicians, very uh, big uh, wealthy corporate owners and billionaires, clearly guilty of uh, a, an arm long list of felonies for which they are not being arrested and brought to legal account. And that is demoralizing for the, the citizens who are watching it going, wait a minute, if any of us did that, they'd lock us away forever. And I mean, the SWAT team would be here in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so why is she or he being allowed to parade around and making a mockery of our country? So, you know, um, leaders set the culture and they enforce it. And so here's what I mean for you to do folks. And here's what I mean for you not to do and what will not be tolerated. And if, if that's, communicated effectively and the people see that it's enforced for then that's that's real leadership and you set that culture and that's part of being a, a point man really in in uh, civilian life now a point man in, in the seal teams 
you're part of a team, a group effort, but your job is to go first and kind of scout out uh, the danger before you drag all your teammates into it, right? So in the SEAL team, if I thought something was hairy, I would stop my guys and have them set security in a place where I knew they were secure, not going to get worn out. And if something was sketchy and I wasn't sure about it, I'd run around and do all the footwork myself, wearing myself out as a kind of sacrificial lamb to go sniff it out and go, okay, that's really bad. Let's not go that way, you know, just to be sure. And uh, of course, there's a principle there for dads right there. I mean, you know, to, I mean, we, we need to be doing that leg work. We need to be doing that groundwork and examining things, you know, and, and, saying, okay, is this something that is a viable option for my family? Is this something that is going to hurt my family and have the potential of doing harm? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, what, that's one thing you, 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 you touched on too there earlier about that, those lateral limits. And I think a lot of, like a lot of, of dads or a lot of husbands, a lot of men in the church uh, a lot of times have been almost emasculated in a way of saying, no, I'm the disciplinarian in this house like i'm the one that's setting like i said setting the tone setting the pace and and a lot of like the men just go eh, i mean i'm not gonna i don't want to fight and so they let their kids do whatever they want to do there's no discipline there and and then uh those kids I, I mean, i'm sitting here in thailand all the time yeah, these kids now have i mean it sounds like the oldest freaking saying in the world like i'm like 75 years old these kids have no respect for any type of authority yeah. And I think it comes from, like I said, dad's not whooping detail, not taking a belt and just like smacking the piss out these, out these kids because, um, you know, I mean, it's, these kids like literally just try to run a house. And um, and I think that's that said it's detrimental to the society, the culture. When, when kids grow up in a house that's no there's no limits, they get into the world, and they think the same way. And then they're they're just they're lawless, you know. And then they they uh, society starts to crumble. I don't know. What what do you think, there, guys? Structure, yeah. yeah. Children feel more secure when they understand what those limits are. Mm-hmm. They want to know where the limits are, and that's why they'll test them. They'll reach yeah. for that cookie. Oh, Papa said no. Mm-hmm. They'll try and see if they can get away with it. And when you hold a hard line, and you say no means no. Yeah. I love you. You've had two. And that's going to be it for you to, for today. And uh, you'll understand why more when you're an adult. And uh, man, but if they know where those limits are and they know that Papa's got it and Mommy's going to back him and the things are, the structure's there, they feel secure. That's, they need that. So when it's squishy and there are no limits, children feel insecure and they feel Absolutely. lost and that is not healthy and it's not loving to just yeah. allow them to wander around and figure out things for themselves because they don't yet have the understanding of how things work. And uh, we, we should teach and mentor them and empower them with, with the, the wisdom of how things work. That's why we should all value the wisdom of old people yeah. and, uh, yeah, no doubt. and even, even read books that old people wrote and what, how much better to read a book that uh, a bunch of old people wrote with divine wisdom mm, that's and, right. uh, and that's been tried over, over time and it has remained the best selling book of all One time. Bestseller, that's right. Year after year after year. So yeah, we, we need to consume that, that wisdom and uh, we need to pass it down to our chillings. And chillings. Uh, and one of those things that, you know, that, that, you know, when, when you start, I mean, we're talking about guys and how to take control and how to like, not take control, how to, lead like lead from the front right and and being and not be somebody's pushing but leading right uh when you start doing that because a lot of us have have slacked off in that area and backed out i'm i'm guilty as anybody right and i have to you know get checked every now and then go man i need to start leading my family better but the moment you start doing that the moment you start leading your family especially if you haven't done that in a long time you're going to meet resistance you're going to meet and it's not going to be from outside it's not going to be something else it's going to be your own family it doesn't want that they're going to resist that because that's uh, going to be uh, it's fighting against a a a, a um, how do I say it? I said how to say it nicely. Well, it's a how do I, power dynamic. Yeah, it's a go. it's look. It, it's the same thing that all military families deal with. Hmm. Typically, it's the husband that's the military member. He leaves and he deploys, 
and mommy has to become the head of the household. It's left on her yeah. to run the household in his absence. And she does her best yeah. and she figures it out over time and the kids adjust to it. And then they have something that is a survival mechanism that's working for them. Well, then husband, a lot of times returns, I'm the head of the house. You're going to do what I say. And they're like, well, we're not used to that anymore. It's mm, been right. six or 18 months. And, yeah. and basically who are you? with the, the dirty laundry that's just comes home <laughs> once every couple of years, you know, yeah. uh, for exactly. do your laundry and leave again. And uh, yeah. that it's a power struggle that, you know, people, once they're, they got in a routine, we work creatures of habit yeah. and we're comfortable with what we know and not comfortable with what we don't know. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's uh, you know, when you begin to assert your authority, it's, you're going to meet with some resistance and it, it's got to be done in love though. Yeah, exactly. yeah, people respect bingo. you if they know that you have their best interest at heart. If you're just an abusive bully, uh, they're probably going to poison you or, or kill you in your sleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you <laughs> get fragged by your own family. I was going to say that. It was about love and limits. You know, before yeah. John and I were talking earlier, uh, and I was sharing with you, uh, you know, I was a school teacher, and uh, every school I taught in was – what we would call, you know, a title one school, lower socioeconomic, a lot of uh, families, you know, typically these were the kids that, you know, would, you would see get in a lot of trouble. I had literally like zero discipline issues in my classrooms. Like I remember the first time I went to this one particular school, like mm -hmm. literally it was so bad some years back, the sheriff SWAT team had to come to the school and it was a middle school. And my first week there, I was talking to my kids, we're just doing our thing. And my door opened kind of slowly and I looked over and it was the assistant principal and she just stood there for a minute and um, looked around the room and she looked at me and then she left. And later on, I asked her, I was like, is everything okay? I was like, did, did you need anything? And she said, well, that's the first time we've not had anybody kicked out of that classroom. I took over in the middle of the year for a lady who had just had a kid and, and she's like, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? And, and that's what I told her. I said, I just told him what I was going to do. And then I did it. <laughs> and, I, and I saw it again and again, you know, it's that love and limits thing, man. Just like, you just, you just tell them what you could do with a reason. Don't be saying stupid stuff, you know, like, well, I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to take everything out of your room and leave you with a sheet, you know, but like, which could work. I did take all my son's toys one time and left him with lint. Uh, never, ever. I got to tell that story real quick. I think Craig will love this. Um, when my son was, when my son was three, right? He's 21 now and my daughter's 17. <laughs> There's like four years difference between them. I kicked him in the face. <laughs> he learned twice. <laughs> no, but like so, I was a, I was a high school soccer coach, and and I told him I was like my my wife had put like little pictures on all the tubs in the room, right? Like this is where your stuff goes, and he wouldn't pick it up. And I told him I was leaving for an away game that day, and I said, dude, I got down his level real gentle. I was like, dude, I said, check it out. I said, when I come home. If the stuff is not where it's supposed to be, it's, it's going to disappear for a little bit. Okay, daddy. I left. I went to my game. I came home. I walked in. The stuff was right where it had been. I did not even say a word. I went to the garage. I got the little tub out and I brought it in a room and I put it all in the tub and I took it to the garage. Literally left homeboy with his little teddy bear and some lint to play with. And <laughs> people, somebody out there right now is going, that's terrible. But you know what? Three days later when I brought it back, he put it all where it was supposed to be. A few years later when my daughter, who's a little younger, I told her the same thing. We could hear him in her room helping her saying, let's, let's put this stuff. He's not kidding. He's not kidding. Let's put this up. <laughs> yeah, stuff. and it's good habit. It teaches them how to be responsible and handle things well, you know, and uh, there's just absolutely um, no reason why we shouldn't teach them and mentor them that way so and, and being a, and that's something being a good being a good dad being a, as a guy and those kind of things being involved is i mean it's really one of the ways that 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 even when we speak about trafficking we speak about um things that are that me and craig fight um it's this this idea of of being a parent that knows what your kid's doing 
right? Being involved in their life is a is if you want to protect your child from trafficking, that's one of the best ways of doing it is being a parent that's actually involved in their life. That's not that gives them limits, that gives them boundaries, that says nope, this is right, this is wrong, we're not going to do this. Th- that's one of the things that I, I think um, if you if you want to protect your kid, that's one of the things to start with is 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 setting those limits and being able to to be a part of their life. That takes us to a, a that's a fantastic segue uh, into what you know we want to talk with with you about next, Craig. And for our listeners who, who may not know this. Uh, John works with an organization called SWAT, Spiritual Warriors Against Trafficking. That's why he's in Thailand, and he is involved with training a, a lot of the rescuers and with empowering these women and children who come out of these situations by teaching them uh, self-protection, self-defense. Craig, uh, that's kind of how we made this connection. Uh, Craig actually fights sex trafficking right here in the United States. And, and, you know, we, we, um, you know, as men, this this is an important topic uh, for us to talk about. And I just, I just want to turn this over to you, Craig, bro. And just, just lay it on us, man. Just, just talk real with us about what you do, what's going on and how we as men need to step the freak up and get involved in this. Yeah. Well, I got my heart broken. Uh, over three years ago, it's uh, more like five years ago. Uh, a friend of mine from an intelligence agency was letting me know that an area north of Houston, where we had grown up, had become the central hotbed for child sex trafficking in the United States. And I just was perplexed by that because the culture there is so counter to that. And when I started talking to other investigators, federal investigators, on some of these big crimes, they're letting me know that, uh, Craig, this is, this, it's an ugly thing. There are different layers to it, but all the way at the bottom core, the dirtiest, most rancid, evil part of this is a conflict that you're not gonna solve with a badge and a gun. It really is, uh, if you dig down past the, the sex and the perversion and the political manipulation and, and uh, and power gained from you know, blackmailing each other and filming each other with kids and all the things that they do. Mm-hmm. And, and you get even past the, the just the, the physical abuse and, and some of the mental sickness and, and all the different aspects of the criminal trade, you get down to a frontline clash between good and evil. And that's what's going on with the children and that's why child sex trafficking is the fastest growing criminal enterprise on earth because evil has kind of gone unchecked in the last couple decades and it has accelerated. And I just, I was, I was, I was so heartbroken that I became angry. And when I get angry, I, I'm like Chernobyl. There's like steam coming out of my ears and it's not healthy. I need to take action. I'm not someone who sits and worries and wrings my little, you know, moisturized hands about, you know, how bad things are. Uh, I want to find a way to start solving the problem. And because that's been my muscle memory my entire life. So I took an assessment of it and I thought, okay, what can I do about this? And the problem is, so you, you have to realize when I was searching for my solution, I come from a, a covert background where the cloak of secrecy is a very beneficial asset. If you want to go into an enemy's nation and start operating against them, you want secrecy. You need secrecy to survive in, in some cases when the conflict is that uh, heated. So I thought, you know what the problem is? These idiots, these child traffickers, are enjoying the asset of secrecy. The veil of silence that the big media and big Hollywood are providing for them, they're enjoying a lot of top cover. And I thought, if I really wanna go at this, if I really wanna climb into the lion's mouth and, and, and flip open my Swiss army knife and start sawing away on his larynx and kill him you know, directly, with what little I can, it would be to expose and compromise the entire operation. And 
tick off and break the hearts of and ignite the 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 American people. Recruit mm -hmm. 320 million citizens uh, as as not a neighborhood watch, but a national watch and even a global watch as it grows to look after the children as an alert piece, like the Paul Revere banging pots and pans and flipping all the lights on. I believe that sunlight is the best antiseptic for corruption. So mm. I'm, I'm flipping all the, all the lights and say, look, America, look at this filth. Look at how they're hunting our children and, and look at how it all works so that we see them, we dog them, and they cannot do this under the veil of secrecy anymore. We will take that from them, their best asset we will take from them. And I, I realized that a documentary was going to be the best tool, the best nuke weapon, if you will, to bring that about. So I'm like, okay, I want to film a documentary. So I talking to all my contacts in big Hollywood. And they're like, oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> really yeah. good. We love it. <laughs> and it's silence went by for about yeah. three years. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, uh, I, I already know this game. Right. I'm not going to play this game forever. And so uh, I'm like, OK, I'm going to crowdfund this. We got crowdfunding now and uh, I'm going to start crowdfunding. Well, all of the big tech crowdfunding crowdfunding um, platforms began playing some very juvenile, very criminal games against us to keep us from rallying the money to uh, film the documentary. I'm like, OK. Uh, what's next? And a lot of my friends are saying, Craig, you're going to have to found a nonprofit organization to rally the funding to do this independently. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like Jesus in the garden. Like, Lord, let this cup pass from me because a, a 501c3 nonprofit organization is such a, an IRS bureaucratic nightmare. paperwork nightmare. And it, the burden is so great of how much work you have to do and to be a nationally certified 501c3 means you have to register separately in every single state and it's been, it's worse than a mortgage loan application there's a, oh, so much that you have to do and they're all different they're all different right so we had to we had to spend a lot of money and a lot of man hours uh constantly just satisfying the irs to, uh, just for the status to conduct business as an i not for 501 nonprofit org so, but I'm like, okay, if that's the only way to do it, yes, yeah. Lord, even, even this, I'm willing to do even this you know, as a warrior, you know, paperwork is my, we might as well be cutting my, <laughs> cutting my Death skin with a a paper, cuts. paper cuts, you know, 24 <laughs> seven, right? That's what bureaucracy means well, to me is a constant like paper cuts torture. Well, that's so something, that's, a, that's we're doing it there. Though. Yeah. That, and that's something that, that, you know, the film came out, dropped what yesterday, today it dropped yesterday. Um, what? Yeah, it was amazing. We'll Today's talk the about ninth, that, so it just drops. So go check it out at uh, Contraland uh, uh, dot com. Um, John's in it, by the way. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that. If if he had stopped interrupting me, I'm gonna I'm gonna sing well, his no, praises. But I, 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 I was trying shut to up say, you can no, do it. man. I was trying to like say like people, and this is like people were like going, "Oh, uh, you crazy, man. This ain't happening. This ain't, and people were saying that. People said it all the time. Like, hey." This doesn't happen. This doesn't happen. This doesn't happen. This high level stuff doesn't happen. And then Mr. Harvey Weinstein and what's the the the, the island Jeffrey sex Epstein. Island? Yes, Epstein. That junk blew the lid off some stuff and people Mile High Bill when the low oh, maybe this is not just some conspiracy stuff that's going on. Maybe this is actually happening. And so I think it's very timely that that this that the the, the documentary's coming out when it is. Uh, I think that's God's providence going and saying, hey, you see this over here that you thought was crazy? It's not. And now you have another way of coming in to saying this is what's going on and how we can fight it. I'll Bingo. Say this. Bingo. Bingo. And, and I, I apologize for giving such a long-winded run into no, 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 why no, no, I founded no. Vets for Child Rescue. No, and no why that's it was why you're needed. here, brother. But we, know we were undermined, and I won't drag you through all this, but we were undermined from the inside by, by financial predators who are at war with God in their own lives, mm -hmm. trying to infiltrate our organization uh, through third parties and uh, and get their hands into it and dishonor it. And uh, we've peeled them back out in every case and kept the ship uh, tracking true north. It's been very expensive and very uh, painful process. 
but uh, with God's help, we've overcome every single challenge, and, and it's beautiful. And I was so frustrated that, that this, because I knew that the, the harm was happening 24-7 to the children, and I was in a big rush, and I was impatient. But like uh, John just said, God's got his own timing, and it is better than my timing. And my faith has grown through this. And, and now I don't have this stress that I did early on because um, I, I see that whenever it lands, it's a, that's when God means for it to land. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. I want you guys to understand as you're listening to Craig, you might be thinking, well, you know, you're still team six, you're like, you're a warrior, you know, this, this, you know, but I want you to understand this, he did this at a, a, a huge risk to himself, not, just physically, but even financially, because, you know, Craig's been involved in shows like Top Shot and things like that. Craig has a company that he works hand in hand with Hollywood, helping them get their weapon stuff straight on movies. But, but so stepping out here and putting this documentary out there, you know, actually flies right in the face of, of some of that, because some of these very people are the people doing this stuff. And so yeah. it, it took guts to do. And I'm going to tell you guys, I, I mean this sincerely. You need to watch this documentary because as a father and a, a, a Christ follower, I mean, you need to uh, sin always thrives. The enemy always thrives in darkness and in ignorance. And we need to know these things and you need to, understand going forward you're probably going to feel sick the whole time you watching it because i did i literally felt like i was going to throw up the whole time but i powered through as my 70 year old daughter says i powered through and you know it left me with a sense of okay what can we do what what can we do to stop this garbage and and deal with these people uh, obviously we're not the law but what can we do to support that uh, and 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 become part of that army, that 320 million strong watch group you talked about. Yeah, well, the the reach. Uh, so Contraland is an alert piece to inform the American populace on the threat against us all. It is destroying the future of our country, and it's destroying countless children's lives. It is absolutely psychologically shattering them, even if they survive it physically. So. With uh, Contraland, everybody needs to see it. It needs to go viral in order to have the cultural turnaround needed to, to create a safer world for children in the future. And we've got a take action section on our website, vetsforchildrescue.org. It's connected to the Contralandmovie.com website. And it's, it's got a pre-written letter to your elected officials. It's got a drop-down menu to allow you to identify who your elected officials are so that you can send that letter to them, demanding stronger enforcement for our children. And it's another thing where uh, it, to testify to the fact that we have to roll our sleeves up and get involved in the political process to get what we want out of our elected officials. We have to hold their feet to the fire to get better representation. And we need for them all to know that we demand better protection for the children, for all children. And this predation on them is not okay. It's evil. And we will replace politicians like it's a sport if they don't back <laughs> our will. And we will get them the heck out of there. And we will prosecute the, the crooked judges. And we will hold people to account. So as I began filming Contraland to inform the American populace on the nature of this threat, I decided to go and include some of what's going on in Southeast Asia. And so our brother John Espy bent over backwards, man. I cannot tell people no. how much effort he put in, how appreciative I am of his heart. And he took me all over Southeast Asia. He put my <laughs> hand in the hands of so many people. He made introductions in good faith. Hey, you, this is Sawman. Here's what he's doing. You know, they, they want to film some of what you've got going on. And, and a lot of these people had sensitive things going on that I had to be very careful with. And John had to have a lot of trust in me and ask them to have a lot of trust in me. And so um, it was it was no small effort on his part. So I want to make sure people know that he put that out. He made that happen. He made that contribution. 
No, nah, man. It was fun. We got to, I got to hang out with you for, for three weeks, <laughs> man. We got to drag you all over Southeast Asia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so I thank you, you for that, brother. No, man. I, it was it was great, man. I literally, it I mean, it, it was work, of course. Like We had to go and do a lot of work and do a lot of stuff. But, man, I had a great time with you. I, exactly. Well, it, know, it, you know it must part, have man. broken you because I see they got you locked in a padded room now. I know. It's all, <laughs> it's all padded. It's soft. That's fantastic. It's soft. <laughs> those three weeks have, have taken him down uh That's this awesome. is like so uh, this is what how god works right so we got this new house you got to come see the new house by the way fly mm -hmm. like over here and god bless us with a, a new home uh cheaper than one we were doing before um and it's bigger and so we got like we're just filling it with kids we got six kids now um but one of the rooms the guy that owns it is a musician or was a musician and so he had all this like sound dampening stuff put in the whole room so i got like a little a little ready-made podcast room i was like oh when jesus opened it up it was like all right here we go so yeah. that's pretty anyway. cool it's like god was preparing it just for you man yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's what I would have said if I was locked in a padded room. Exactly. I would have said, this is hey. a sound room. <laughs> exactly, it's a sound room. <laughs> Dang it! So that's why they. No, were that's cool. Really that's cool, they let man. Me out every now and then. <laughs> I literally good. have been in this room, like, cause, like, we've been, we've been, we've been pumping out some interviews. We've been pumping them out, man. Uh, and so we have been in this room a lot. And so it's starting to kind of close in on me. John and I have stared at each other on the the screen a lot. Um, it, it's, it's it's interesting doing a podcast with somebody who's literally on the other side of the world. Like the other day, we interviewed a friend in Melbourne, Australia, and so I don't even know what time I got up to do that interview. And it was, but but we we love doing it. Earlier than I would have. It is. It's so would've. much fun, and we feel like we're trying to hit on stuff that we feel like nobody's really talking about and, and try to encourage men to step up and, and lead and leading doesn't mean being, uh, you know, a domineering fool. One of the things that Craig said earlier that caught my attention was, you know, as a point man, he put his team at rest and then he went and did the groundwork. He was the one doing the, the looking for danger. And, and that's so, much a picture of what Jesus does for us, man. That is, that just like struck me um, that that's what he does for us. And guys, look, we, we're not perfect. And John and I aren't perfect. In fact, in a few weeks, you're going to really hear how unperfect I am and imperfect. I am. You're perfectly, you're perfect. Your, your head is perfectly round. Perfectly bald. That's it. And that's bald. Good. But, um, but guys, we, we have been given, we only get one shot at this. And there are forces that are legit trying to take out everything we hold dear. And if you can destroy the children, if you can get every, every evil person in history has that wanted to destroy a nation or control a nation has talked about the importance of the children and the enemy is coming after our children. And we need to understand that, you know, sex trafficking and exploitation is it just through prostitution and those kind of things now? It, it, it is, it has been really for a long time. It's just now seen the light of day. It's kids. And we've got to step up and, and be a part of this fight. I don't, I don't, whatever you can do. Everybody can't go live in Thailand like John does. Everybody doesn't have the skill set that Craig does as, as, you know, a former SEAL Team 6 uh, member. I mean, if you're watching this online, I mean, you know, you look, I mean, these guys, they even look the part, but do something. Everybody can do something and needs to do something. So, um, and, and one of those things you can do is by supporting Vets for Child Rescue. Um, write a check. And, 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 hey, man, that's, that's a way of doing it. That's a way sharing the sharing the the the, the video the movie the film uh, it's a great way uh, and i was i was shocked man like you got matlock's secretary up in that joker i mean she when yeah. she walked up first i was like how you get matlock's secretary like i'd like to say hi to her i mean <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome she did such a great job man i i'm really appreciative of everybody that had anything to do with helping 
get this documentary together. And I think yeah. God's going to deal with those that have come against us. Yeah. It was and, a very uh, well done piece. Some have already paid a uh, mm. pretty significant price for uh, messing with what I believe is God's mission. It's not my mission. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to be, literally, I'm trying to be a, an obedient servant and go, God, what would you have me to do? Yeah. Well, rip the lid off of the, shine the light on child trafficking yeah. so that we can, the nation can culturally uh, stand against it so that we can denounce it. We can call it out yeah. and denounce it and stand against it. Uh, okay, uh, figure it out. <laughs> How to get that done? So, you know, and if, it's if you uh, together we are what we can't be alone, folks. Yeah, we can all oh, good. link arms against this thing. And uh, exactly. if ever there was a, a no-brainer cause, mm -hmm. it should be just leave the children alone, let them be safe, and let them have a happy little childhood. I mean, yeah. we should all agree on that. And uh, mm -hmm. I have no 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 hesitation opposing someone that that, that yeah. thinks that raping a child uh, is in any way a good thing. Yeah, yeah. That that's yeah. The, that's the thing is like it should unite people across every party line, every denomination line. It should unite people to say, you know what, you know, having sex with a twelve year old's not a good thing, you know. Or, you know, it, or some of these kids that are, you know, rescued out. There was, I think it was a four-year-old rescued out um, not too, a couple months back out of the, the Philippine group. And you're like, man, that's, everybody should be able to unite over that. Um, and I'm hoping and we're praying that this film helps that, that, that happen. And if, you, if people haven't got a chance to check it out, like, go check it out. Um, you got a guy in it that's Jack, uh, Jack, Reach, not Jack, Reach, his name is. Farmer. Um, Jack yeah, Farmer. That's it, Jack Farmer, who is a former spook guy that's just amazing to listen to. He's basically uh, the guy they, they based Jack Ryan on, if you, if yeah. you read any Jack Ryan or watch any of the yeah. movies. Jack um, Farmer and a couple of his colleagues are the guys that presidents over the last few decades have reached to to solve major national security crisis, yeah. uh, like in the Tom Clancy movies. And so... Mm. Uh, we're just we're grateful to have guys yeah. like Jack Farmer on our board at Vets yeah. for Child Rescue and yeah. and heroes like Bob Hamer from the FBI who got an eight arrest on senior NAMBLA members. Mm. Uh, yeah. NAMBLA is a pedophile organization that targets children. Mm. And uh, yeah. Dr. Judith Reisman, and oh. uh, she's a professor at Liberty University. Yeah, she's, she's been calling out uh, sadomasochistic yeah. pedophile Alfred Kinsey's false doctrine. Uh, and, and falsified studies for 50 years. She is a champion for the children, uh, the likes of which I've never seen elsewhere. Yeah, She's yeah. another one of my heroes. And we've got uh, Admiral I'd Moore say, on our board and uh, yeah. just fantastic uh, people behind us. And uh, we appreciate it. We've aligned with uh, partner organizations too, like SWAT Ministries International, uh, because they handle a different aspect of the crisis than we do. I'd look at it like a, you know, like a football team. Mm. You know, if you got a quarterback and you got a wide receiver, and you got a, you know, a, a tackle that's that's. Yeah, if you look at the quarterback and the and the offensive tackle, they're, they're not going to look the same. Why? Because they have a different function. Yeah. You can't have eleven quarterbacks on the field and win. Mm. You can't have eleven wide receivers on the field and win. You can't have eleven tackles on the field and win. It's the diversity that allows you to cover the spectrum of the, the conflict in front of you. And so SWAT Ministries handles an aspect that we don't. And Rancho Milagro handles an aspect that we don't. Yeah. And Soul No That's More good. and Soul Survivor Inc. And they are, these are all good people, very effective at the aspect of it that they handle. And we handle the yeah. exposure and the direct... Uh, confrontation with the uh, predators arresting the predators that's that's our lane and so together we are this kind of holistic coalition that really is bringing a, the can of yeah. kick pants definitely what we got, <laughs> what we, what we got to do what's... guys out there i'm sorry buddy i was always going to say it and i would throw it back yeah. over to you man is we just have to stop being distracted and you know the the enemy's greatest weapon against us is deception and distraction and we get so distracted 
we've got to pay attention to causes like this. I mean, I talk to John about it all the time. If I, if I post something about sex trafficking or SWAT or, or, or anything like that on my Facebook page, crickets. It's crickets. But you let me post a picture of like a burrito <laughs> or a puppy. It's oh. sad, isn't it? Oh. I don't like 300 people comment on that, man. I mean, like, guys, we, we, we've got to step up and talk about the stuff that is, is hard to talk about. And um, I appreciate guys like Craig and John. And, you know, I, I, there's, there's things that I, I'm involved with with John kind of on the back end, and I want to do more. I want to do more. I'm like, personally, quite honestly, I'm, I'm like uh, convicted every day. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. John, I tell John all the time, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. Great. What can I do? I need to do more. We've got to be engaged. Well, don't let John sound like he's all good because uh, if you watch Contraland, you'll see that I had a beard in the film. Yeah. And now it, I don't, and John does. So what does that tell you? <laughs> John saying. took my beard. I left it in Thailand, <laughs> but I didn't expect him to be wearing it. I'm just saying. I'm just like, surprised you know, he's not sitting there in a trench coat. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, you look like a 12 year old girl. I'm just saying, you look like you're going on, you're trying to be like a bait, a bait girl on your next and, hop. That's what you look like. And only Sorry, would I'm, you say that to a SEAL Team 6 member if he is thousands of miles away exactly. on the other side he, of the planet. He ain't got a gun that can shoot that far yet. And I'm safe. We're, we're <laughs> both sitting here with beards, and he's, he's, I feel like I should go shave. I feel like I should do what he does. So I'm going to go shave oh. and I'm going to come back. So, <laughs> but, but uh, one, one of the things I was going to say was, uh, was that if, if this, to, to go back and talk about the, 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 the film just for a second, the, 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 the stuff you had for Miss Judith, I could sit and watch her section for like hours. She needs a I podcast. Just, she like, that was like, and you have like some, like you said, you have some major, major players in this, in this film. And but her little her section, but I was like, God, like she just has a wealth of knowledge out there, and like she laid you know, it out, man. Just doing and, stuff like another film with her, I would watch. Yeah, and you know, there's a balancing act to how much of each aspect you put in a, a documentary. Mm -hmm. Because speaking of distractions, yeah. people don't sit and listen for very long, and so uh, we try to keep the dialogue pieces broken up so that it, you know the pacing was right and uh but the information that she brought was so powerful i'm glad to see people um having her words resonate because man i just i celebrate that woman she's yeah. tiny she's mm. maybe five foot tall and she's uh she's i think 83 now and she's mm. all over this planet like a yeah. like a shooting star she's everywhere yeah. she's internationally traveling constantly i can't keep up with her if i want to talk to her it's uh I'm, I'm fortunate if i can get her on the phone she's a sweet sweet little thing mm -hmm. but she has single-handedly fought alfred kinsey's mm -hmm. horrifically abusive false doctrine for 50 years and god bless her for it mm -hmm. and uh I, what mm -hmm. i mean to be doing is just backing her up you know like if a marine's uh pinned down and he wants to he's fighting but he's if he can call in air support and air support right. could come in and drop some bigger bombs mm -hmm. the marine's going to be thankful for that close air support and I, yeah. I feel like whatever assets i can bring in to help mm -hmm. dr judith's fight and, and bring in the big bombs and man that's a blessing for me yeah. to be able to to fly that plane in and drop those bombs and bring in bob hamer mm -hmm. and jack farmer and mm -hmm. admiral moore and and all these other organizations and film a documentary and, and lift her up and celebrate her contribution so that uh you know um yeah. she eventually can look back on her life and see that she was amplified and that we are carrying the fight and she's not alone that's, that's the awesome. thing is like if, for those that don't know who alfred mckenzie like i messed his name up alfred mckenzie right if you Kinsey. have mckenzie like yeah kenzie Ken, not mckenzie if you, all you gotta if you do never, is look at a picture of that joker and know he ain't right yeah i mean if you've never heard of that like you just think it like it's sad when you, from, you first hear it in the documentary a little bit. It's gonna sound crazy. It's gonna sound. I'm just gonna warn you now. It's gonna sound crazy. But go look it up. It's like the most horrific um, thing that I think, like, like, like Dr. You said, that's happened in American culture uh, is 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 what he did, and and it's it is horrific, and it's it sounds crazy. 
until you look it up and start seeing it. It is, it is obscene. Well, here, and here's a snapshot of it. So as a scientist, uh, he paid grown men to rape children uh, for, for part of his study. And in any screaming, kicking, flinching, jerking, or passing out, or any of these horrific reactions that children have when a grown man violently rapes them, he marked down as orgasm because mm. as a pedophile, that's what he wanted it to be. So he falsified his studies and he went around politicking our legal system, mm. our educational system, and our psychological health care systems to mm. soften them all to the idea of child rape being okay. Yeah. And so four generations later, we've got ourselves an epidemic. And he started a wildfire of harm and abuse. And little Dr. Judith Reisman has been kind of the counter Kinsey. She's been a champion for children saying, no, this is harmful. This is horrific. We mustn't do that to the children. Yeah, yeah, and so, I, you know, I, I see myself as, as her wingman and I'm, I'm just bringing whatever big guns I can yeah. to back her up. Cause God is, God's got his hand on that little woman. Oh, yeah. He really does Definitely. bless her for it. And she's an LU baby. She's an LU. That's right. We're both like, LU grads right here. <laughs> LU baby. LU. Uh, <laughs> I feel like LU should sponsor us. Like I'm just I don't saying. know. Might, I mean, hey, like you, you know saying. Jerry Jr. You know Jerry Jr. Uh, Craig. You know Jerry. No, I don't. I, mean, I don't know him. Oh man, you, get, you need to go no go get to know him, and then you can connect. And then together. tell him. And then need to sponsor him, hey, us. This podcast is pretty cool. Just saying <laughs> so. So check this out. Just uh. I, I, I know I've heard at least that uh, it, it kind of transitioning to there are maxims, if you will, that the seals live by. I listened to a, a seal guy on another podcast and he was sharing some of the maxims you guys live by, like sayings you have that work in life, you know, that could this uh, kind of give you that foundation of, of, how to handle operations. And, you know, I think one of the things he talked about was like, um, like, uh, like one is none and two is one or something like that. I, I, I'm, I'm not a solo guy. So, but, but share some of those if you can with, with our guys that will help them to, to hang on to those, to, to grow. Well, one of the, the strongest aspects of the seal culture that I picked up was, is that if you really want to win on game day, you have to have the will to prepare to win. Mm. And it's all in the conditioning and the, and the preparation, the hard work that goes into preparing for game day. That way game day should be easy. And the SEAL teams, we don't intend for a fair fight. We don't, we don't uh, it's about national security for us. So we have no sense of humor about losing our jobs to go and win. And uh, we figure out new ways to do that all the time. And we show up highly prepared. And when we execute, it's uh, one and done. So I th that really can be applied to anything, any job, any corporation, any effort that you're going to do. If you really want to do it well, there's a lot of preparation that can go into it. And you will be better and more effective at it. So I would say if you care enough, then you will prepare and study. And uh, oh, that's and good. You'll have if you more, care more enough, effect. you prepare. That's good. That's good. Yeah. John, the, um, the one, the two is one and one is none speaks to redundancy. And that just in a, in a hostile environment under adverse conditions, things break and fail. And so if you only have one of them and it fails, you're dead. So if you got two, then if one fails, now you got another one. You're still in the game. Do you, that, do you know what I mean? is a big deal. That, that, that doesn't oh. include wives, does it? That's Sig, no, no, no. It don't work that <laughs> no. way. Oh, no, that, that'll get your throat I messed cut. it up. <laughs> yeah. I will tell you, though, I, for real, like, I, I heard that. And, and and I'm a musician. I play guitar, worship band, and all that stuff. And when I heard that, I started carrying backups of everything. Uh, I, I started having backups of everything. I have extra patch cables, all yeah. kinds of stuff, you know, just because – Something gonna go wrong, and so I was like, "That's good. I can hang on to that." Yeah, because and, uh, if you're on a big national tour and you got a stadium full of of tens of thousands of people that have paid <laughs> to see you, they they don't want to sit and wait because yeah. you're you're, so, up, you're such and such is broken, right? 
you got roadies that you, you nod and they run out there and then you've got the That's next right. thing and the show goes on why because That's you've got right. redundancy and you've you've prepared so That's yeah man good. it applies uh, speaking of speaking of which we're, we're, we're getting kind of in here but uh, i do want to uh you craig, uh, craig's a, a musician guy he likes music he plays uh I mean, I guess technically a drummer is a musician, right? That's that's still still a musician, right? Not not in most circles now. We're <laughs> okay, just made bad, fun of. Bad. We're ridiculed for hitting things. We only hit things. <laughs> Drummers are the guys who make a lot of noise while the guitar players are trying to tune. <laughs> so um, so um, one of the guys we had, like, uh, we actually just interviewed him a couple, a few weeks, days ago, but he was the uh, the guitarist for um, Guy Sebastian and stuff. Um, and so the reason I bring that up is that when you come out uh, and maybe we can get him out here and we can have a little jam session next time you're in Thailand and he's over here because we didn't get to jam last time, man. We didn't jam. We will time. kick it. We will kick it. I need to come at the same time. And, you know what I'm um, saying? Go ahead and play. Uh, well, that would be actually awesome, like, if all three of us came, John, and, and we got together and we had a band and played. Just saying, man, come on. Come on, we pretty and trippy. John, uh, my wife Tressa says to tell you hi. Oh, we'll the tell Miss Tressa. I said, hey, give her a hug will. to me. I will. She told me <laughs> when I, before I was coming to get set up, I said, hey, I got a you know a couple interviews this morning. She's like, oh, who with I told her? She goes, tell him hi, hi for me. I'm like, okay. I'll, say <laughs> it. I'll never forget. That's I was cool. uh, we were sitting there I was talking to Miss Tressa and, and uh, at, uh, at at Craig's house, and she was like, we're talking about about you know lineage and stuff. And she looks at me and she goes, what ethnicity are you? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I, I guess we I'm ask white. John that question all the time. <laughs> I will never forget that in my entire life, Craig. Tell her, thank you. That makes my heart feel good. I'm John like, is a I'm, good example I'm, of the, the, the Mississippi redneck. Exactly. Just, just a mix. Just I a think that's what he of, said. <laughs> exactly. Probably was. Probably was. But uh, Craig, man, thanks so right. much for hanging out with us, brother. We really appreciate Dude, you. Dude, yeah, you have honored us, man. Absolutely. I, I appreciate it, and uh, uh, I enjoyed chatting. And <laughs> and it's important to get the word out. You know, have uh, we? Absolutely. God knows we hear from enough lunatics mm. and people who are trying to deceive that's us. Right and people with a negative agenda. So it's refreshing to hear from good people who want good things and want to bring truth and uh, just an honest discussion to people. So uh, keep up the, the podcast, guys. I'm liking yeah. it. So uh, uh, <laughs> we'll do our best. Look forward we'll do our to best. More. Tell a friend or tell somebody yeah, you don't like. Well, guys, <laughs> look, you heard you heard Craig talk about how to, tr to find him on social media. One more time for them, if you will. Tell them one more time how to find you on media and how to see the film. Yeah. Well, the biggest thing is go to ContraLandMovie.com right now. And from there you can find everything else. Yeah. All right. ContraLandMovie.com guys do something, get involved in some way, write a check, pray, you know, pray for these guys. I mean, their, their lives are li legit in danger and then putting them, they're putting themselves on the line. Uh, everybody can do something thanks for listening guys to another episode of the guy stuff podcast we'll see you soon god bless you guys peace